Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get going. So I'd like to start promptly. So my thought was that we start promptly at about 10 minutes after. So I should, I should, I should welcome folks. I'm, I'm Terrence Blackman. I'm the Dean of our School of Science, Health, and Technology. And I want to, on behalf of our president and our provost, uh, welcome you to this uh, annual School of Science offering to Women's History Month, the Betty Shabazz Lecture. I should, I should say, uh, I should say first off how I came to sort of name this lecture, Betty Shabazz Lecture. In 2008, I was a five college fellow at Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts. And in driving around the campus, I noticed that there was a Benny Shabazz house. And I had been a faculty member at Clint Rivers for quite a long time, and I knew that Benny Shabazz had been part of our faculty, and noted that we did not have a Benny Shabazz house at Clint Rivers College. And so I thought that at some point in the future, whenever the opportunity presented itself, I would try to have something that memorialized Benny Shabazz in our, in our context. For those of you who are young and uh, perhaps not so aware of this, Betty Shabazz is the wife of Malcolm X, and she's Dr. Betty Shabazz. She is, a, she is a faculty member here in the Department of Nursing and a very critical member in the development, senior administrator in the development of Mid Rose College. And so I thought that this would be a small effort on the part of the School of Science uh, to sort of honor Dr. Shabazz and the work that she'd done. Uh, actually, the other thing which is sort of quite important is that for many years we had a large scholarship which was awarded at, it was the largest scholarship that was awarded at a graduation, quite a sum of money. And it was, a, this was money that was donated to the college by, by Dr. Benny Shabazz. Uh, so, so it's that impetus that, that has led to us leaving, leaving the lecture, the Dr. Benny, Dr. Benny Shabazz lecture. I think I want to say one more thing which is of importance. Uh, you know, many of you know I'm a, mathematician by training, but I'm a scientist. And in a sense, it's my primary identity. And so I really strongly believe that ideas matter. I really believe that, you know, in order to create opportunities, you, you, you sort of have to generate ideas. And the universe is a place that is not only a place that generates ideas. And quite often, you know, people ask, well, what kinds of things will make you know, what will kind of enrich a discipline? Uh, what kinds of things will, will, will help to generate new ideas? And so this seems, as an African American, was very obvious to me. It's that, you know, new people generate new ideas. And so part of what you ought to be doing is to figure out how to enlarge the group of people who are participating in science. And so it, it has always been very odd to me that as a culture, we have, we have not, in a very serious way, uh, thought about ways in which we engage a 50% of our population in the world of science, i.e. women. And so, you know, it gives me great pleasure to, to, to stand here today and to say, you know, in the School of Science, uh, in particular, where this is really, I mean, you know, one can look at the data, and, uh, I mean, for example, in mathematics, 2019 is the first time that a woman has won what is considered the Nobel Prize in Mathematics. It's for the very first time, in 2019, the first woman so So, so the, the, the dearth of women in science is really immense. And so I, I, I would hope that you know, my vision for the long term is that Med Rivers College becomes a place where, where young women, particularly young women of color, can find the world of science that kind of affirms their identity and kind of leads them to win thinking about the big challenges in the society as it relates to things in science. And uh, that's the spirit in which I want you to think of, 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 of this event that we're a part of. Today we're, we're, we're really honored to have a wonderful guest who can talk to us about some very interesting things in science. And, uh, you know, better by and then it's there and I'm going to ask one of our students to kind of introduce us, or is because I think it's important. Uh, but I, I think that you will be you know, pleasantly surprised to discover some nerdy black girl magic. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I'm going to ask Karina, uh, Steven, Steven, to introduce her nerdy black girl guest. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
Dr. Taylor is current, Dr. Tanya Taylor is currently assistant professor in the School of Medicine at SUNY Bath State. She earns a BA in International Relations and Political Science, double major, with a minor in Spanish Language and Literature from Boston University, and a master's degree in Anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania. She holds a doctorate degree in Anthropology from the University of Pennsylvania and a master's of degree in Biostats. Clinical Research Method from the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Her doctoral dissertation is entitled Healing Trauma of Everyday Life, Traditional Medicine HIV and AIDS in Rural Zimbabwe. Dr. Taylor has been the recipient of a Career Development Award for her work from the National Institute of Mental Health, and she has been a Butler Williams Scholar at the Institute on Aging Research. Her works reflect research interests in HIV and AIDS, HIV and aging, sexual and reprodu reproductive culture, health and treatment seeking behaviors, comparative system of health and healing, HIV prevention, sexual risk behavior, and health disparities. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together as we welcome Dr. Tyler. I hope you recognize yourself. Yes, I did. <laughs> Two of my slides, thank you. Um, I want to thank my colleague from the WISE who joined us, who's one of your faculty here. Thank you. Um, so what an honor um, to be invited uh, to talk uh, about for this Women's History Lecture in honor of Dr. Betty Shabbat. So the title of my talk today is Nerdy Black Girl Magic, which I will try to break it down for you. And before we started, I, there were some folks who were in the room, and I was just sort of sharing that I was really surprised when I Googled Nerdy Black Girl Magic that someone hadn't sort of taken it and sort of owned it. Um, but apparently, it's not out there. Maybe it's just something that I keep putting out there, and maybe a collection of us will embrace it one day. Um, however, there are sort of two movements. Uh, one is uh, the Black Girl Magic. Uh, um, and I, I think often, um, Actually, well, this is sort of separate in terms of the Black Girl Rocks sort of uh, celebration. But Black Girl Mag Magic was, I think, first coined in about 2013 by Sean Thompson um, to celebrate the beauty, power, and resilience of black women. Um, there was a little bit of backlash in terms of some people sort of feeling that it reinforced kind of this uh, uh, particular strong black woman archetype. I, I don't necessarily buy that argument, but, but this is one particular sort of point in the evolution towards our understanding of nerdy black girl magic. So it is a celebration of our beauty and our magic and our resilience. Then there's Black Girl Nerds, which is an online community that was started by Jamie Burns uh, Brodenax. Um, and this was a site that basically tried to create a space and place to encourage young sisters, women of color, um, to basically embrace their nerdiness, their interest in technology and science and mathematics, etc. Um, but you know, I, I found this site a little bit problematic in this little frame because you know there was this, at least this notion that sort of nerdiness was a bad thing. Um, and I, I didn't want to lose the magic, and I felt like there was something about the magic that we have. So I have, I really firmly believe that the nerdiness and magic needs to be bookending sort of our our identities as black girls, black women. So for me, I define nerdy black girl magic as celebrating our academic and scholarly achievements um, of women who are in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, etc. So you know, today I'd like to celebrate Dr. Shabazz's nerdy black girl magic. I'd like to introduce you to some of the pioneers who really inspired me, some individuals who are no longer with us, some individuals who I would love to meet, and the individual that I absolutely did meet who still to this day I'm in awe of. And then I'd like to sort of basically show you a little of my nerdy black magic. Um, I just want to preface and say that this is not, that yes, I'm going to be emphasizing academic achievement, because that's actually what Nerdy Black Girl Magic is about. It's about owning the fact that we can have scholarly 
and academic achievement. So it's going to seem like a lot of going through these folks' credentials, and I do sometimes feel a little embarrassed about sort of my credentials because I, I well, no, in terms of because I'm an anthropologist, and sometimes being that doctor in the room is actually a barrier to the work, and so I sometimes just downplay it. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but I am. Absolutely proud of getting my double doctorate. Hello. Okay, so first and foremost, we need to talk about Dr. Uh, Betty Shabbat, who was the first director of Inst Institutional Advancement in Public Affairs here at this incredible institution. Um, so, uh, Betty Shabbat, I guess, when she was living in Detroit, she was Betty Dean Sander. After high school, she went to uh, to pursue a school uh, a degree in education at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. But I think uh, at least part of the research that I did, and I think she was really dis not discouraged, but I think the the in your faceness about sort of uh, racism and segregation in the South was a little bit daunting for her. And I think that she just sort of had to. To, to segue into something else. I think she really wanted to get out of Alabama. Um, and she also started to think about changing sort of her path um, and wanted to pursue a nursing degree instead. And she was encouraged by the dean at, uh, at the Institute in Alabama to basically come to an affiliate of the Tuskegee Institute. Are you guys still affiliated? I, I, I actually met the president of Tuskegee recently in Washington and we talked about some about, historical antecedents. Yeah. I had no idea that we yeah. had this relationship. That's, that's a, yeah. um, I have a personal connection to the Tuskegee Institute. Yeah. My grandfather was a Tuskegee Airman. Ah. And so I, I think that that's a, a really important no, no, HBC. Fact, Roscoe Brown, who was a Tuskegee yes, Airman, yeah. he had a hand in the establishment of Red Worms College. Oh, super duper. Yes. We'll say we'll the Airmen are doing their thing. So um, then uh, Betty Dean uh, Sanders uh, came to Brooklyn State College of uh, School of Nursing, which I don't know where that is. It's the right one here in King's County. It's, uh, That's what I thought. It's, uh, I couldn't find anything. I'm just sort of like, it's a state college of nursing. It in, must in, be. King's County, I think. Well, that's what uh, so cool. Well, the, the King's County doesn't actually have a school of nursing downstate though. Yeah. So there's no link with this particular term that I thought that. Yes. So that is so cool. I'm going to talk to the president of downstate Same because thing. we need to emphasize this, that Dr. Shabazz, uh, because more than, I think it's some crazy statistic that more than 90% of the nurses in New York City are trained in SUNY downstate. A huge nursing program, and um, and actually also a, a lot of the medical doctors who pass through um, that are here in New York are also trained here. In uh, 1969, which was after her husband's assassination, um, she decided to go back to school and to finish her degree in education um, in New Jersey. And at the same time, I think she whipped it out in a year and then decided to get a master's in health administration along the way i.e. coronary blood romantic was full in effect. And then in 1975, she completed a, a doctorate in education at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Um, a lot of this information was sort of um, alluded to here by your dean, that uh, she became an associate professor here in health sciences. Um, in 1980, uh, she was promoted to the director of institutional advancement. She was in 81, awarded full tenure. Let's talk about tenure lady. Um, in 1984, she was given a new title and held that position until her death. Um, I wish I had known her. She's truly inspirational. And, and to really look at some of her scholarship and her ability to navigate both sort of the research realm as well as administration in terms of helping to make sure the next generation is prepared is incredible. Um, so now I want to just sort of take a little moment to just sort of let you know about some of my pioneers. Um, the truth is I didn't know about these ladies until recently, and now I am thrilled and I read a lot about them. Um, uh, their story is absolutely inspirational. Um, how many people here have seen this film? If you haven't, please. 
watch it on Netflix or uh, um, or whatever. It's a really, really phenomenal story, and to me, I feel like this is one of the the first times, sort of, in popular culture that we really see a full celebration of nerdy black girl magic. Um, so the uh, person here, this is Mary, uh, well actually I have individual slides, but they're actually not quite in order. Um, I believe uh, this is this character, these are this, this is this character, the person in the center, and this is uh, that character. So the first one uh, that I'd like to talk to uh, about is uh, Mary Jackson, who is a mathematician and an engineer. Um, Back before there were machine computers, there was the human computer. And if you did see the film, you would understand sort of the concept of sort of the human computers and the fact that there were huge labs where these women were basically doing really complex like computations, etc. And all with calculate. I mean, but it's really basic sort of stuff. It's really a phenomenal, phenomenal history. So before NASA, there was something called the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. And so uh, Mary Jackson worked there first as a human computer. But the thing that was really incredible about Mary Jackson is that she became NASA's first uh, black female engineer. Uh, she studied at Hampton University where she received a BA in mathematics, and she was a member of the Alpha Kappa, Kappa Society. Unfortunately, Mary uh, Jackson died in 2005. And uh, her legacy continues. She's the first black female engineer. Um, Ms. Catherine Johnson, um, who, God willing, in August will be, I think, 101, uh, um, is a mathematician. And, and her story, which was a really incredible story, um, graduated from high school at the age of 14, entered Virginia State College. She graduated summa cum laude with degrees in mathematics and French at the age of 18. Um, that's, this is some serious nerdy black girl magic. Uh, uh, you don't get to graduate summa cum laude unless like you have, you are absolutely an exceptional student. Uh, she along with her colleagues uh, was a human computer, but her claim to fame in terms of sort of her major contribution in terms of the science is that she was the individual who calculated the actual trajectory in terms of um, that enabled sort of the, the manned spacecraft to be able to come back into orbit. So Alan Shepard and John Lynn, who were the two astronauts that she helped to calculate their trajectories, were alive and were able to complete their mission because of Catherine Johnson. Um, she was honored by uh, President Obama in 2015 with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And in 2018, William and Mary gave her an honorary doctorate. I want to emphasize this. All three of these ladies should have had a doctorate if they had lived in a different time and place to be able to allow them to pursue their advanced studies. So I'm really happy that she was acknowledged for that accomplishment. And then uh, Dorothy uh, Johnson Vaughn, uh, who uh, I think was an extremely clever um, individual. Um, she was also a human uh, calculator. She graduated from a Wilberforce, Wilberforce University in 1929, and she basically worked everywhere, at NACA, NASA, at the Langley Research Center, and in 1949, she became the first supervisor of the West Area Computers. And what I really appreciate about her story is that she had the foresight when the, there was a transition in terms of moving into the mechanical machine, that she was smart enough to figure out to get ahead of the curve and basically taught herself this really complicated sort of like computer programming and was basically the only person to be able to do it. And to a certain extent, and, and she also taught her, her super, uh, supervising, the, the people she was supervising, and to a certain extent kind of in, ensured her job and her sort of relevance in moving forward with the technology smartly. Um, I want to tell you about uh, two uh, chemists. I think chemistry is a really important field of science that is often uh, not pursued by women of color, and I feel it's important to highlight uh, chemists. This particular chemist has a local story. So she was born in Queens from an immigrant British West Indian family that was all about promoting education. 
Um, she earned a BS and Master's at Queen's, uh, uh, Master's in Chemistry at Queen's College and at New York University. And at 47, she completed her PhD in chemistry uh, at Columbia University. She was the first African-American woman to obtain a PhD in chemistry in the United States. Okay? In the, the whole US. Um, but what is really important is what the legacy of her research. Um, in 55, she returned to Columbia and worked with a Dr. Deming, basically studying sort of the causes of heart attacks. And basically, it's because of her research and their pioneering research that we really started to understand the, the connection between food and diet and heart health. And it's because of her that we understand this. And it's amazing. Um, and uh, and she, she was, she was a, a local, well, in our Caribbean sort of community, she's a local product. I want to include this because I feel like this is one of the saddest stories in terms of sort of black, dirty black girl magic. Um, Alice Ball was born in 1892, um, developed an incredibly innovative method to help treat uh, leprosy. Uh, which was known as the Ball Method. And it actually included a little bit of herbal remedies uh, used in India and China. Um, she tragically died in a lab accident where she inhaled some really uh, toxic fumes that she later succumbed to. But what's really sad is that the president of the college in um, Hawaii claimed her research. So, Alice Ball, she, first of all, she was the first African-American woman to graduate with a master's in chemistry. Not a doctor, but she's the first master's in chemistry and also the first instructor, female and black instructor in chemistry in Hawaii. So this despicable president claimed her work and it, uh, as always, truth will come to light and um, she was finally recognized uh, for her work in Hawaii as a plaque commemorating it. There's an actual on Alice Ball Day, the former lieutenant governor created, and uh, she was given a medal of distinction. Um, I, it's a sad story, but it's also a story that's off common in terms of black female or just female excellence and the fact that sort of there was a time and a period where women's scholarship was, you know, claimed by their male colleagues. And uh, we no longer live in that point. But that's a, a cautionary tale in the fact that sort of, to a certain extent, there is still an inherent gender bias within science. And that as black women working in science, we need to be always cognizant of the fact that, like, this is my stuff. And to make sure that we protect our stuff. Okay? Love Dr. Uh, Jocelyn Elders. Um, I wish I could have met her. Um, I hope maybe one day I will be able to. Um, this is one of my heroes, sheroes. Um, she is from Arkansas. She obtained her medical doctorate from uh, Arkansas Medical School in 1960 and a master's in biochemistry in 67. She became in, uh, the first person in the state of Arkansas to receive board certification as a pediatric endocrinologist, the first in the entire state. Um, in 87, she became uh, the head of the Department of Health in Arkansas, appointed by uh, then Governor Bill Clinton. And in 93, uh, President Bill Clinton appointed her to be the U.S. Uh, Surgeon General. She was the first African American woman, uh, or African American, uh, and the second woman to hold that position. She was unfortunately sort of. Um, um, forced to resign because I think actually she was doing the right thing. She was very open about talking about sexual health and um, and I think that sort of in that particular time um, we were still, and we still struggle in our society to talk about sexuality and sexual health. Um, but I think she's phenomenal and she's one of my pioneers in terms of sexual health and research. Um, I love this woman, um, mostly because I do research on sickle cell disease, and I just want to highlight that uh, Mary Stiles, uh, apparently, according to the biography, was all about very black girl magic a long time ago. 
Um, she has a doctorate in molecular biology and genetics, and, um, and she received this in 1975. She's probably like one of the first, you know, I mean, it's, it's such a very specialized field, and for her to have pursued a doctorate at that particular point is really incredible. But what is also incredible is that she decided to step away from lab work and to actually um, take on a, a, an administrative position as the executive director of the Sickle Cell Foundation in Georgia. And I think there, she has done incredible uh, service in terms of leveraging her position her, uh, and her research uh, to be able to raise awareness around sickle cell disease, which if you don't know, is a horrific disease that um, predominantly affects people of African descent. Uh, I would love to meet uh, Dr. Mae Jemison. Uh, she is incredible, and I just want to highlight some of her nerdy black girl magic. Doctor, scientist, what do I have scientists like? I'm sorry. Uh, an astronaut. Uh, she has a bac uh, bachelor's in science and chemical engineering from Stanford, went to Cornell for med school, and while she was doing all this, like somehow found time to study in Cuba and Kenya and volunteer in refugees camps in, uh, in Cambodia and Thailand. Um, after her residency in internal medicine, she then became sort of the, um, the Peace Corps medical officer in, uh, uh, for Sierra Leone in Liberia. I think she was there for two years. And then when she came back in 1985, she decided to pursue her dream to become an astronaut. And we all know that Dr. Jemison was the first African-American female astronaut ever, and the first African-American woman in space ever uh, aboard the Endeavor. And I would love to one day meet her. Dr. Helene Gale, if there is one person that I would absolutely say is inspirational to me, is Dr. Helene Gale. But I really wanted to put Dr. C CEO and just basically I owe a few sort of like expletives here, but she is phenomenal. Um, I met Dr. Gale uh, when she was giving a lecture at the University of Pennsylvania, um, which is where she actually received her medical degree. Um, and I know of Dr. Gale because of the work that she's done in HIV. Um, Dr. Gale is right now, she's the CEO of an uh, organization, uh, Chicago Community Trust, which is basically about helping folks in Chicago. But she's been the president and CEO of numerous organizations, including CARE for over 10 years, director of the HIV TB and Reproductive Health Program for Bill and Melinda Foundation. She was at the CDC for 20 years, focusing on HIV, and she was the chair of Obama's uh, Presidential Advisory Council on HIV, which was sadly disbanded. And then I want to conclude with the one individual who, for me, I think is the spark for my nerdy black girl magic. And that is uh, Zora, Zora Neale Hurston, who I hope that you all should know about. Um, most people know her in terms of her literature as a novelist, but Zora Neale Hurston was the first anthropologist, black female anthropologist, and folklore. I have a joint PhD in anthropology and folklore and she was my role model. Um, she, uh, amazing, so she, she actually did study at Howard University and then came to Barnard. Um, she has a bachelor's in anthropology. She worked with some of the pioneers, the absolute pioneers in the American School of Anthropology. Fran Boas, Margaret Mead, Ruth Benedict, crazy. Um, and she has been my inspiration. So uh, I'm going to tell you about my nerdy black girl magic, uh, which basically is intersecting with medical anthropology and public health. I am, um, I don't have to go through this because this wonderful introduction, um, but basically I just want to highlight the fact that I am a social scientist and a behavioral scientist, although I have my entire life been also interested in sort of the hard sciences and I am in my own quiet way have, although I don't have a science degree, I am a complete nerd about science and medicine. And maybe one day, my husband will kill me, I might be out getting uh, a clinical degree. Mm -hmm. okay. What's a medical anthropology? 
So cool. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I had a whole bunch of slides to sort of talk about anthropology, and I thought that that might be too much, but this gives me a great opportunity. How, does any, does, do folks know about anthropology? Okay, so anthropology is one of the, the key social sciences. It's the sister uh, science of sociology. Anthropology and sociology do basically the same thing. Sociology's sort of starting point is society. Anthropology's starting point is culture. And anthropology, the American School of Anthropology, has four subfields. There's physical or biological. There's cultural um, anthropology. There's linguistic anthropology, because we are, and the endeavor is all about humans, homo, homo sapiens sapiens, right? So we are the only species that has an open system of communication. So that's linguistic anthropology. And the fourth subfield is archaeology. Um, I cover technically three out of the four subfields. I do everything but dig in the dirt, but maybe one day I will. Um, medical anthropology is subsumed under physical and biological. If there's one thing that is common in human history is that we have all gotten sick and that our communities and societies have developed ways of coping with sickness and disease. So the, the crux of sort of medical anthropology is basically looking at you know, how societies and communities frame and understand sickness and disease and how they respond to sickness and disease. Um, what I'd like to do, I'm gonna, I'm not keeping track of the time, but I, I wanna try to get through all of my slides. I'd like to just sort of take a little bit of a moment and show you sort of some of the studies that I've done, which I hope will inspire you, inspire you in terms of finding your own nerdy black girl magic. Maybe you you know what you want, and maybe sort of this lecture might sort of make you hopefully take an anthropology class, <laughs> but uh, or not, or a public health class. So I have two uh, agendas, research agendas. One is international, and one is uh, national. And my international focus has been, as uh, the uh, the person who introduced me uh, mentioned, was in Zimbabwe, and I also do research in South Africa. My undergrad degree was. Uh, international relations and political science, but in political science, I had a, sorry, in, in, no, in political science, I had a focus on South African history and politics. And so I, I feel like my starting point also, my stuff, he's not a woman, but was Madiba, Nelson Mandela, I was part of the anti-apartheid movement. So my love of Africa started a long time ago. Um, my, my dissertation, which uh, the title, Healing the Trauma of Everyday Life, Looking at Traditional Medicine, I conducted a 15-month mixed method study um, on HIV and AIDS in rural Zim. And the, the objective of the study was basically to try to figure out what's going on. At that particular moment, um, so I first went to Zim in 1997, and at that particular point, Zimbabwe had the highest HIV prevalence of any country in Sub-Saharan Africa, and still, unfortunately, to this day, holds that high uh, percentage. It, there was 26.5 percent prevalence, which literally means like almost one out of three. It was a statistic I just couldn't wrap my head around. Um, by uh, 2001, when I started my data uh, collection, it had gone down to about 23.7. Um, you know, at that particular point, about 3,000 people were dying of AIDS-related illnesses almost every week. Um, and, you know, as a result, life expectancy has gone down. Um, there are millions of AIDS orphans who are also um, most of the, uh, not the most, I, it's hard to sort of calculate exactly how many AIDS orphans as a result of losing their parents also then were vulnerable to acquiring HIV. But that particular pattern is very common. Um, Zimbabwe is this little pink country here. It's a landlocked country, south of um, uh, South Africa, Mozambique, um, Botswana, and Zambia at the top. Um, and at that particular time, you know, we knew the factors that were enhancing risk: poverty, gender inequality, concurrent STIs, um, concurrency, meaning sort of having multiple sex partners or polygamy in, in this particular context, which is which is cultural, uh, low condom use, and labor migration. But you know, the bottom line is it was affecting the young, the poor, and the rural women the most. Um, there was no treatment for HIV 
in Zimbabwe in 1997 or 2001 or 2002 when I finished. Um, I think antiretrovirals were only introduced in 2006. No, yeah, 2006. Um, the thing about Zimbabwe is, you know, it was the worst possible scenario. You have all these people who are living with HIV and there's no treatment. And the majority of the folks were living in the rural areas where there's limited access to Western medicine. So nobody was going out to the rural areas. It was like a black box, like, oh, no, no, we can't go out there. There's no running water, whatever. And Western researchers didn't want to go, but I went. I was determined to go. Um, and I decided to focus on what was what cultural strategies were helping people who were afflicted with the disease. And so I focused on the use of traditional healers and how healers were providing, to a certain extent, psychosocial support um, to help people cope with the fear and anxiety of um, having HIV. Um, this is the name of my field site is Chipingi, uh, a place of travels in Shoshona at uh, Chipingi Mupiyini, which is the nickname of Chipingi, which means a place of trouble. Um, and that mostly because there's a, the national thought that there's a lot of witchcraft in Chipingi. Um, Chipingi was an ideal uh, site for my study. It was a border community, large commercial farming, migrant labor, long distance trucking, which is associated with the spread of HIV in uh, East Africa high literacy, extreme rural poverty, enormous gender inequality. There was a military camp also associated with high levels of HIV and commercial sex workers. I don't think we use commercial sex workers in the term anymore. At the same time, it felt like it was going on forever. There's always been economic and political crisis. This image in terms of this guy holding all this money in terms of millions of dollars of Zim notes, you know, I think it's going on actually in Venezuela, sadly. I mean, I remember in the field, carrying around. Big bags of but, Yeah, it was crazy. It was just, you know, there was a hyperinflation, which is absolutely crazy. Uh, this is the Chippingy town, going into town. Uh, this is Gaza Clinic, the high density area. Oh, this picture doesn't, is that the, the butchery? I can't remember. This is like a traditional house in the high density area. This is a traditional roundhouse where actually I conducted most of my research with the healer as my, my, my truck. Um, and we spent, I spent pretty much 15 months hanging out in little huts like this. Um, and it's just a beautiful place, the highlands. Um, unfortunately, part of it has actually been affected by the floods uh, from uh, Mozambique. Yeah, and uh, I send my prayers to them. So, you know, for tr traditional healing, so first of all, Medical pluralism is the norm, norm in Zimbabwe. People use Western medicine, people use traditional healers. There's no issue or conflict because to a certain extent they do very different things. Okay, and you know, traditional, you know, um, you know, traditional medicine does provide palliative care and sort of pragmatic treatment around certain things. HIV? No. Um, but the thing is that it's, it's not considered sort of in lieu of Western medicine. It provides an alternative explanatory model or a way of, of explaining sickness and misfortune. And so, you know, what traditional medicine could do is they could answer the why. Not the what, the epidemiology, the virology, or the, you know, how, the epidemiology, but why? Why did this happen to me? And this really is around sort of metaphysical kind of questions in terms of why. Um, these are images of some traditional healers. Um, uh, the one at the top is a diviner and the one at the bottom is uh, raising someone's spirit. And basically it's the traditional system of medicine is called Unanga. And basically it's the premise of, of healing is that sort of you need a balance between coolness and purity to counteract the heat and pollution of social conflict. Sickness to a certain extent, is always kind of created by people. Okay? It's a very bottom, it's called Shimeri Shivano. Illness is created by people. Examples, witchcraft, greed, envy, etc. And that there are different types of illnesses. There's normal or abnormal or naturalistic and personalistic. You can be working out of the field, it rains on you, you get a flu, it's a natural kind of thing. But if it goes on too long or if it acts in a different way, like way that's not normal, it doesn't respond to medication, then people might shift into 
the alternate explanatory model. This is not a normal flu. Someone sent me something. My dissertation was really talking about the performance of healing, trying to basically look at the healing process as performative. This is an image from ER. I know most of the people here are way too young to remember the show. But basically, it's, it's about the healing performance. And a lot of the healing performance, as we go into downstate or Kings County, there is a performance of healing. There are defined roles, prescribed scripts, an attentive audience, <laughs> a therapeutic setting, diagnostic props, the white coat, the stethoscope, and you know, ritual costumes. Right? Exactly. It's in, in biomedicine as well. Um, my research basically focused on three different types of traditional healers. There are five or six in total, but the three that had sort of overtly theatrical components in their, their healing process. Spirit mediums, the minor state healers. Um, there are a whole slew of characters in terms of healing spirits and harmful spirits, uh, ritual treatments, and uh, particular ethnomedical diagnoses. Um, I'm just skipping through some stuff. Uh, so for 15 months, basically, and the population that lives in Chukangi that are called the Endow, I recruited 24 healers. I had over 400 patients. 200 were, were recruited in traditional care sites and 200 in Western care sites. Um, there were, in the traditional care site, there were 12 different villages I went to. Um, and basically, I recruited folks according to the presence of a particular opportunistic infection with HIV. So either if they had TB, uh, recurring SDI, uh, shingles, um, chronic diarrhea. There was no HIV testing in the country, so I used um, the antiquated WHO clinical guidelines to assess the likelihood. Um, this is me with the nurses. Everyone could tell that I was not Shona because I was this woman looks like she's taller, but I seem to have been like a head taller than everybody. Um, and our method basically, we recruited folks, we did a baseline assessment, and then we did a follow-up, a uh, one-month follow-up. I recruited like, a ridiculous amount of data. If any students want to help me with some data, I have lots of qualitative data and survey data. I collected over 1,300, uh, no, 800 baseline surveys and then 500 follow-up surveys. Um, so this is uh, basically a summary of the paper um, where we looked at the main outcome, which was quality of life, comparing it with the traditional versus the Western care, and basically found that the traditional care subgroups reported uh, significantly better uh, quality of life over one month compared to the biomedical care subgroup. Um, and a lot of this has to do with just sort of, I think, attention. And the fact that sort of like folks would queue up for two hours to see a doctor and see that doctor for maybe about 10 minutes, and where you know a traditional healer might spend two hours figuring out sort of the, the whole thing. It's not just the presenting illness. It's also you and your your social dynamics and your uh, you know uh, your co-wife and your husband's gone off to South Africa and you're afraid and etc. Um, this is the second paper that I published um, that analyzed a particular performance um, uh, where basically the, the spirit diviner uh, lectures me <laughs> um, on basically uh, how to do good research. It was a very interesting one. Um, but I also juxtapose it with sort of um, this one particular patient who sought his care and this particular performance um, and how sort of his trying to lecture me um, kind of really uh, damaged sort of her assessment of this healer at the end. Um, this, I was going to bring a DVD with actually this particular performance, um, which was one of my favorite performances. So maybe if I can come back, I'd love to talk to you guys more about this, because I actually collected 150 hours of digital video, 304 examples of the healing experience. It's really cool. Um, my second study in Zoom was around cultural con uh, conceptions of Zimbabwe. Uh, the gentleman at the top of the name is Dr. Dixon Shibanda, and he is, at one point, there were only three psychiatrists in all of Zimbabwe. And he's an amazing colleague, amazing sort of advocate around mental health in Africa. And he came up with an intervention called the Friendship Bench, um, which literally is sort of is a lay health worker basically providing psychosocial support. And uh, but we did a pilot study to just try to figure out sort of what's the prevalence of depression, 
Uh, we used a, a, a physician uh, uh, interview to assess uh, whether they were depressed or not and compared it with other sort of uh, questionnaires that may or may not be helpful with a lay health worker. Um, high prevalence of depression, this is also, also the study was only among people with HIV. Um, but we sort of found that the, the lay health instrument that we wanted to, to use um, was not specific enough. It had a high sensitivity but a low specificity, and so there's some work that needs to be done there. My other research um, in uh, South Africa focused on um, masculinity, um, and I do a lot of research also with men. And so this is a paper that I wrote talking about uh, fatherhood and about assisted reproduction, which I think is a little problematic, but, but folks who are living positively absolutely have the right to, and we should do everything that we can to help them if they sh should choose to want to have children. It's just a little bit complicated to do that in Africa because there are cultural sort of prohibitions in terms of having sort of strangers come into your family. It's a really fascinating study. My US agenda, um, here in Brooklyn, uh, I was part of the development of this intervention called Barbershop Talk with Brothers. Um, I led the formative uh, research and we published a page of paper, Perceptions of HIV Risk, um, that basically identified, and this study was only with um, heterosexual, I think it was heterosexual, uh, were they heterosexual? With black men at risk. Um, we used barbershops as the venue. It was really an exciting study. Um, and partnered with Arthur Ashe. Um, and we found some really interesting sort of psychosocial components in terms of sort of emotional buffers around sort of like having multiple partners that like guys didn't want to put all their eggs in one basket. So I need to have like my side piece and my other side piece. It was really fascinating. Um, but emotions was a really big part in terms of trying to figure out what was driving risk. We also found that sort of that this population does test a lot. But that doesn't mean that the, that the high level of testing doesn't mean that people are actually maintaining and sustaining safer sex practices. Um, I, I did uh, um, research with um, uh, a doctor in our emergency department in Downstate um, to assess sort of the needs of sickle cell patients. Um, her name is Teresa Smith and she's amazing. Um, and basically we looked at the high frequency users uh, of individuals with sickle cell disease who are coming into the emergency room to manage their pain. And so there's a lot of stigma towards adults with uh, sickle cell disease, that they are drug seeking, that they just want to come in and, and so forth. And I find this really despicable because folks with sickle cell disease you know, it's the nature of the disease. The disease actually can create dependence. So it's like we're blaming folks for being addicts because, it, you know, it's it's no fault of their own. And like we need to think of like more human, humane ways of helping folks to deal with their addictions if they are addicted, but also in terms of the stigma and discrimination within sort of the clinical context. Um, and then we also interviewed uh, kids. And of course, it's a very different situation. A kid comes into the emergency room, is in pain, they'll give them all the opiates they want. An adult walks in, no. They'll make them sit there and suffer in pain for hours. Um, I, right now, like my biggest focus is on health disparities and aging. And that, you know, folks are living longer, absolutely, because of access to healthcare services. But the truth is one in four older American is not sharing this equal, uh, you know, better life. And a lot of it is due to health disparities. Um, Brooklyn, I think, is a microcosm for aging and health disparities. Um, you know, heart and stroke disease are the leading cause of death and disability. And one in 10 residents in Brooklyn have diabetes. And that the largest number of fall-related emergency visits are among older adults. Um, but again, my focus is on the, uh, HIV, and so I just want to sort of show you that sort of with antiretroviral medication, folks who are long-term survivors are able to, what time is it? Uh, you, you have time, but it's, uh, okay. it, it's 30, so you can... Okay, I want to I, I want to give enough time. Yeah, but the bottom the line is, because of medication, folks are able to um, 
uh, medication with extended life expectancy, folks are living longer, and so everyone's like happy, and I am happy that there's treatment. Um, but the thing is that sort of we're once again at sort of a black box in terms of HIV research. Well, right now, we're faced with an aging cohort, and the fact that here in New York, the majority of people living with HIV are over the age of 50. And the individuals who are aging with HIV, to a certain extent, have a larger burden of uh, morbidity than their HIV-negative counterparts. So for example, one study, the ROA study based in New York, found that um, among 50-year-olds who are HIV positive, that they had three times as many comorbidities as someone who is HIV negative and 70 years old. And we have to say that the graying of the epidemic disproportionately is affecting uh, women and uh, minority groups. Um, and my big thing is that I feel that sort of with this aging issue that no one is focusing on sex and sexual health. I find it despicable that after 30 some years where we're all up in people's business talking about who you doing it with and when you doing it and so forth, that now that the cohort is aging, no one wants to look at sex and sexual health. Uh, my colleague who's also in the wise in the back, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Like, I, I'm on lots of working groups and no one wants to focus on sex and sexual health, but I am. Um, and uh, I also concurrently separate, um, I did uh, a study on prevention needs of older men and trans women with and without HIV at Down State, which is really fascinating. Um, and basically kind of found out that sort of like the older heterosexual guys were doing not as well as our gay and bisexual men. Um, erectile dysfunction is really common. Um, and. Uh, but I want to go back to, oh, this slide is out of order, excuse me. Um, several years ago, in 2011, I was uh, lucky enough to get a career development award from the National Institute of Mental Health. And basically, the focus of this grant was to look to identify the prevention needs of older women. So a, a huge part of this uh, study was, uh, this is the next slide, was based on um, using data from the women's inter, oh no from the women's interagency, I don't know what's going on, HIV study. Um, and basically, I looked at a lot of extant data from the WISE data uh, to try to figure out what was going on in terms of sexual risk behaviors, which we now call condomal sex, or because if you are virally suppressed and you don't use a condom, it's not considered a sexual risk behavior because you have suppressed your virus so we, we now call it condom sex. Um, I had a second aim, which basically was prospective. I used mixed methods and did a cross-sectional survey, added additional factors, and did some qualitative stuff. And the bottom line was that I was to use this information to try to develop an intervention. This is a slide outlining the women's interagency HIV study. Why is that happening? And it's basically, yeah, it's it, is, um, it, is, it is merged with um, the men's study called the MAX, the men's AIDS study cohort, and now we are called the combined, what is it called, the combined cohort study, but everyone still refers to the studies as the Y's and MAX. Um, and originally there were six sites, now there are 13 sites. Um, Brooklyn is one of, Brooklyn and Downstate is one of the sites, uh, Bronx, Chicago, San Francisco, LA used to be a site that dropped off. Then we have uh, wa uh, Washington, D.C., and there are a whole bunch of new sites in the South, Alabama, help me, Alabama, Atlanta, you're not going to help me, uh, <laughs> uh, um, Mississippi, I can't remember, because um, the slide is not letting me. So my first study looking at uh, the extant data and the whys, we looked at longitudinal trends in sexual behaviors with advancing age and menopause. And we found that sort of over 13 years of follow-up, lo and behold, people are not using condoms, they're engaging in condomless sex. Um, and then, um, but then we were also looking at just sexual activity in general, and we found that the negative women were having more sex and also having more uh, risky sex than the HIV-positive women. 
but that the um, women with HIV didn't show a greater decline in sexual activity compared to the HIV negative women. So they were still sexually active, but probably not as risky. These are just, I'm going to skip over these. Some data, 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 data. Uh, the second study was a mixed method study. And we did a cross-sectional survey, and some of the, the additional measures were around social support, loneliness, uh, disclosure, and looking at partner characteristics. Um, in the cross-sectional survey, there were 2,000 uh, women, 28% uh, had uh, condomless sex, which we were calling unprotected anal or vaginal intercourse. And among the older women, about 21% uh, reported condomless sex. I'm going to skip this. It's interesting, there's some stuff around sexual function I'm working on the paper right now. Um, I did uh, 40 in-depth interviews in eight focus groups in Bronx, Brooklyn, and in Chicago. And this is one of the papers that I wrote up. It's uh, a pleasure is be better as I've gotten older. I felt that my first paper should really talk about sexuality. Hello, older ladies are getting busy and enjoying themselves. Um, and we found that sort of there were there was a low perception in transmission risk, uh, mostly due to the per to perception that they understood that because they were women that it was harder to give it HIV to a man, but also they understood that treatment as prevention, um, if they were virally suppressed, the chances were low. Uh, a lot of partner characteristics were driving HIV risk. Uh, they're trusting their partner, the length of the relationship, uh, basically the fact that they have had a history of having unprotected sex with their partner, and he didn't acquire the virus, so they figure they're good to go. Um, and also just the fact that the partners were accepting the risk. Um, we also found a sort of perennial problem of non-disclosure. I have some quotes here, but I'm not going to go through them. You know, um, this this one is talking about you know basically the fact that they were together for a long time, and that she trusts her partner. Um, this particular woman uh, sort of said that, you know, like, I want to use condoms, but, you know, not by my choice, I, you know, but by his choice. He doesn't want to use it. Um, the length of the relationship, you know, it hasn't happened in 19 years, so I'm not worried about it. Um, risk without consequences. This person in particular is talking about how they've been together for 12 years, and they haven't used condoms consistently, and he's still negative. So there's my evidence. Um, Non-disclosure, a huge issue. Um, we found that this is a paper I'm working on about sort of disclosure and a need-to-know basis. The summary of the, the quote on the left, basically this, this wonderful woman who I interviewed was literally put out on the, is it the west side? No, the east side highway. She was trying to, in the relationship, really excited with this guy, thought this was the moment, disclosed her status, and he put her out on that highway. You know, the East Side Highway, that like big Mack trucks are like, I mean, she could have been killed. Um, and, uh, and then the other woman is sort of sharing about sort of like, you know, sometimes I just think like these folks are crazy and I just need to protect myself. Um, here's the story of this woman. We thought that she was just having a booty call and ended up marrying this gentleman and basically lived with the fear that she was going to infect her husband. Um, and every time he went to the doctor, she was in fear you know, that you know, he was going to come back. He did die. He died of cancer. Um, and this is a really interesting case. This woman who basically had for years been in a long-term partnership, never disclosed, and, you know, and feels like because her and her partner met each other in rooms of recovery in terms of that addiction and so forth, that, that just assumed that sort of there was, there was risk in the room at that particular historical moment. Probably everyone in that room was HIV positive. So she doesn't know her partner's status. He doesn't know her partner's status. Probably the likelihood is that he's positive too. But like she's living with this man for years and hiding her medicine and they don't talk about it. Um, so I used all this information. Maybe I'll go back here. I developed a program. I piloted it uh, at SAR. Initially, the program was called Sexual Health and Aging Program. I know, bad, bad, bad. Um, and I basically thought that risk equals risk. If I just identify or recruit folks who are having condomless sex, that I'll capture all the risk. But this pilot uh, taught me a really uh, uh, important lesson that sort of, that just because they're having engaging in condomless sex doesn't mean 
that, that there's risk, that 80% of the women were violently suppressed. Um, but that the real risk lied in the fact that sort of there was a 20% that were not virally suppressed. They were um, had poorly managed uh, multi-morbidity, multiple diseases. They weren't taking their medicines for their diabetes, their hypertension, and of course their antiretrovirals. They had concomitant uh, psychosocial factors, depression, substance abuse, etc. So then I revised it. I like this title much better. The change, which is a euphemism for menopause. The, the key in this intervention was to try to re-engage this population into talking about HIV prevention, but the hook was like, let's talk about menopause and the ladies love it. And, um, and so we developed this and, and really sort of decided to shift the focus around sexual risk to focusing on healthy aging. And so I'm still desperately trying to get this grant funded. You know, look, there's a lot of ageism in, um, in the world, in our communities, um, and they, they are impacting health and health outcomes. And in particular in HIV, I feel that this is constantly reinforced with the emphasis always on our young folks. And I understand that the new incidences of HIV are among young men of color who are having sex with other men, is the, the category that we, we focus on behavior, not identity. But the, tr the truth is that it's ignoring sort of other populations at risk. Um, doctors are not talking to their older adults about sex at all, like, well, hey, oh, too much information. Um, it's just not happening. And it's a missed opportunity. We need to work with providers. Um, they, the CDC has encouraged sort of the, the age limit be extended to 64 years old uh, for HIV testing. Um, but I just want to say in our clinic, um, several years ago, we had a gentleman who was 80 years old who basically came in with what we call a dual diagnosis. He found out he was HIV positive and he had AIDS. And 80 he, years old. 80, 80 years, years old. And so, you know, folks are getting busy. Um, <laughs> these, are just, uh, these are some, it's true. And we need to, you know, I, I as a person over 50, I feel like I want to be that you know, like this is, it's, it's so disheartening to go to conferences like focusing on sexuality and sexual health and it stops at 24, you know, the conversation. And so I, I want to be a part of that, trying to get people to realize that sex and sexuality is good for you, it's good for your health as you're getting older. I have a whole lecture about that. Um, these are some ads talking uh, about um, safer sex with older adults, um, you know, it's important, but you know, these are the mostly the images we see of older adults getting busy. Can anyone here figure out what's kind of really wrong with this? Yeah, exactly. I literally, I ran into uh, Spike Lee's uh, sister and I was just like, you need to do another, she did a PSA for young people. And I'm like, you need to do a PSA, because there are no images of older uh, black folks being intimate and loving and you know and, and emphasizing their sexuality. They're always very kind of you know, I mean it's nice to get a hug and to laugh a bit, but it's like we're never project presented as sexual beings. With the exception of this this clip in the middle, which is actually uh, I think it was taken down and but I got it. Um, it's a Red Bull campaign that had these two older adults get busy and they're like a Red Bull can. Red Bull, by the way, is a really, a really horrible drink. Please don't drink Red Bull. But the Red Bull cans all over the place. And it's a, it's a funny, funny commercial. Um, so I just want to acknowledge like my funding from NIMH, Social Science Research Council, all the folks in Zimbabwe, uh, again, NIMH for my K, the Ys, the President's Health Disparity, uh, my Ys uh, contributors. Um, and this is my team uh, in Zimbabwe, including Shaka the cat, <laughs> but the other use was cat in Silicon was MIA and Shimba. Um, this is my uh, my Zulu translator, and he died of AIDS. Um, and there's one other person in here who acquired HIV sadly after the study, which really broke my heart. So thank you guys. Um, the point of sharing with you some of my nerdy black girl magic is to just try to be an example 
that um, there are multiple paths in terms of nerdy black girl magic, um, and in particular around science. And today, I wanted to share with you sort of, you know, that non-clinical, I'm not a medical doctor, um, although I think that I, I try to get a medical doctor to share some time with me, because um, I think that the two hand in hand are really important to focus on the, the clinical or the hard science juxtaposed with the social and behavioral science. But um, there are lots of different paths. Some of you want to go into clinical care in terms of nursing, education, uh, doing biology. Maybe some of you will be in the PA, et cetera. Um, I would encourage you guys to find and embrace your nerdy black girl magic. It's in there. We all have it. And we need to celebrate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, thought, I thought we'd take a moment uh, to, to have some questions, extremely thought-provoking on a number of levels. I, I actually knew you'd be really good because you know, the conversations we had. So uh, I'm not going to ask any questions. I will just quietly embrace my pretty black girl magic, and I will give to you the first question. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so, so maybe just one moment, I just want to acknowledge uh, Dean Rule and, and, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Carr as her faculty members and Dean. Yeah, and Dr. Carr is my colleague in, in the WISE, MAX, combined, whatever the heck it is. Thank you for that. I had a, a question regarding to the latest information about uh, uh, in HIV transmission, the undetectable equals untransmittable. How does that translate to risk and risk behavior? Like what does it mean to have this new behavior in the context of our understanding today? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of also like with the PrEP, if you don't know what PrEP is. Um, um, you know, and I, I think that sort of we need to look at that. And the fact, do you guys know the U equals U campaign? That's uh, uh, sponsored by the uh, Department of Health. Um, so that's what Dr. Carr is sort of talking about in terms of there's a, a new campaign that's, um, that is um, unlike PrEP. Do you guys know what PrEP is? Okay, PrEP is a medication that if you are HIV negative and at risk of getting HIV, meaning that you are hanging out in a particular social circle or something, doing something that might put you at risk, you can take this medication and reduce your chances of acquiring HIV by 98%. It's phenomenal. But yeah, I, I read today in the newspaper, I think it was the Washington Post, like there was an article talking about how taxpayers are made, paying millions of dollars and this pharmaceutical company is making a lot of money. Gilead is making a lot of money with Truvada, but it's like, I really hope that they're not going to set us up for these idiots like Vice President Pence to basically then attack this HIV prevention strategy. But so that's for the negatives at risk. But what Dr. Carr is talking about is a campaign that's around um, uh, primarily around folks who are living with the virus, and in terms of really trying to get people to achieve and sustain an undetectable viral load. And what Dr. Carr is sort of talking about is about, am I, am I right? Is about sort of what we're seeing now is a resurgence in risk behaviors. And you know, and just like at the beginning in terms of the introduction of press, prep, we saw sort of this this kind of resurgence of risk behaviors. And so, um, I I don't know how to really answer your question other than I think that we there's something that we're not doing when we are um, introducing these these particular strategies. Um, and I, it's, you know, sexuality and understanding sort of what people need and do, and it's, it's complicated. You know, people are making choices, right? Um, and so, um, you know, and, and the one consequence in terms of sort of acquiring new problems is the rise of um, SDIs. And here in New York, we have a huge <laughs> epidemic in terms of SDIs. Are you guys aware of this? Oh yeah, yeah, like serious, like, you know, syphilis is making a major comeback, chlamydia, um, um, 
uh, gonorrhea. I mean, it's. Yeah, you did have a I'm glad you said that because a lot of people think I'm over 50. I I got through that period of life where you know, like I, I remember reading the Time magazine and Newsweek when HIV was being introduced to the world, and we survived all that. But actually, the the there was a rise in the new cases among adults age 50 yeah. and older. And so if you know someone who's 50 plus who is going to be getting out on the dating scene again, you sit down and have a conversation <laughs> with your mom, your, your, no, I'm serious. <laughs> My mother knows I'm an HIV researcher and she got a new partner and I totally, I was just like, I know this is going to be weird, but I need to talk to you guys. <laughs> Sorry, I need to talk to you. And, um, and because, you know, it's, it's true. Um, and so as uncomfortable as that feels, and, you know, we're struggling with having conversations with our medical students. So I'm faculty in the College of Medicine, so the only minimal teaching I get to do is with, like, twice a year with the med students. But I want to come back to Dr. Carr's um, question. And, you know, so, yes, we're starting to see engagement in risk behaviors again and that people are sort of feeling kind of you know that, that invulnerable and, and that they can do whatever they want now I've, I've got a license I've got my binders down I can do whatever I want but you know there are other consequences you know um, you know getting herpes for example is an SDI you never get rid of you know, do you want to be 65, 70 years old and getting herpes? You know, on top of, um, on top of having HIV? No, herpes is, is painful. Um, so, so I, I'm not sure, Dr. Carr, if I answered that. Or if you have any other information that you want to share with us. Sure. One is the prerogative of the lottery. So you mentioned the first uh, African-American woman who was a PhD in chemistry. And I, I was sitting thinking, we have a chair of our chemistry department, and it occurs to me that you were the first African American woman who was the chair of the chemistry department here. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. See, this is, we need to celebrate this. And, you know, and I, the, I'm going to sort of step out of like, kind of like my, uh, like my academic thing, but I think that sort of black women so in the true. academy, in academic, we, we don't support each other enough. And I really, really think that like, you know, I want to surround myself with like, you know, colleagues like you in terms of, because there are so few of us. Yeah, there's so few. I was so happy walking in here, seeing all the students and beautiful faces. But the truth is, when I go back to downstate and I go into some of the meetings, and Dr. Carr can attest, like we're the only chocolate chips in that room, <laughs> you know? and it doesn't feel good, you know. And people are making decisions about our community and how we should do things, and we're not in, in engaged. And and so we need to figure out how to support each other through tenure process and promotion, dealing with life stuff as women, dealing with kids, working mommy. It's it's complicated. But support your sister. So I have a bit of a question. So uh, what if you have in your last few minutes, what is your sort of inspirational pitch to black women considering STEM careers? Um, why is their presence necessary and valuable in the field generally, but specifically regarding the uh, To kind of reiterate the fact that sort of like we need to be in the, in the room. Um, and, you know, I think that sort of, um, I mean, what, you know, what, what, what legacy are we going to leave, right? We need to, we need to encourage. I, one, one of the, um, my heroes that I wanted to put up was the woman who founded the Black Girl Codes. Her name escapes me right this very second. Um, and we need to figure out ways to support um, the inclusion because we, in all of these, whether it's science, the hard sciences, or the social sciences, uh, maybe the social sciences and behavioral sciences, there, there are some sisters there. Um, but in terms of medicine, in terms of um, public health, um, in terms of research, in terms of technology. There's one sister that I just 
thought I had too many slides, who basically was a medical doctor who created this in incredibly important patent. And I'm just like, yes, you know, get on, like the first black woman to like have a patent, you know, and I, I think that that's really important. We need to be in the room because decisions are being made that are going to affect all of our lives and they need our perspective. We are needed. The science cannot advance. You know, just like your dean sort of said in the beginning about sort of ideas matter. Our ideas matter. We can like, you know, it's, I really do firmly believe that inclusion, that our voices in that mix, that we, we need to be there to further the science. You know, whenever I sort of see kind of, you know, like homogenous kind of little groups doing stuff and, and you know, mostly like in marketing and stuff, you know, I'm just like, well, did you have a black person in the room? <laughs> but the thing is, it also breaks down in science. Right. And the fact that sort of people are constructing studies in really funky ways and are not necessarily thinking about the communities that they're affecting. Okay? <laughs> Representation matters. And don't just hire, you know, a black person to do the interviews. You know, don't, you know, tokenize it, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a little problem. I, I think that engineering and technology in particular are the two areas that are, um, the black women are not exposed to. And I think that that's one of the crucial areas that we should think of, which is one of the reasons why I started off the slide highlighting those incredible women who are mathematicians, and engineers who basically helped us get you know, the, the US space program off the ground. And then I followed up with the chemists because I feel like those, the mathematicians, the engineers, and the chemists, these are areas that unfortunately are not nurturing us. And so we, we need to figure that out. Unfortunately, I have two boys. I mean, not unfortunately, I love my two boys. But if, I, <laughs> if I had a girl, I mean, I'm doing all kinds of STEM stuff with my boys, but I realize, like, I need to find another place where I can also provide that mentoring for a young, uh, a young girl of color. Although, so we're about 70% women here at college. <laughs> we, will, we will welcome you to be a mentor for young women at college. I'm sure it's much that they can learn from you. Okay. And, uh, you know, we just wanted to thank you. No, Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Marvin's here. I'm like, no, I'm like, no, you want to come back today? Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. So there's some pumps to yourself for coming up the wall. Oh. Yes. Thank you so much. And me too, Warner. I'm going to actually skedaddle because I have any grant. Meaning, uh, I'm trying to put together uh, a huge grant on health disparities and aging at Downstate. Um, the nerdy black girl magic, unfortunately, there, there were a lot of meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I do hope to sort of stay in touch. And I, I didn't put up here like my email, but I'm getting would you share the slides? Would you share the slides? Yeah. yeah, sure. Actually, I have them. Okay. And so I, I will share them with folks. I will take a look at the okay. attendance okay. list and I'll just share them. Okay. So if you can address it, I'll send it to everyone. Okay, excellent. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We just started a nerdy black girl award. Yes, across my, uh, in your school, like you give a, an award to a student.